And we're back. All right. Let's do this. Chapter four, the pressure principle. Under pressure, you can perform 15% better or 15% worse. Scott Hamilton. When you have fun, it changes all the pressure into pleasure. Ken Griffey Sr. and Jr. He was a sickly child, his growth stunted by a rare digestive disease. Kids at school called him Peanut and other hurtful names. A figure skating judge said he was too small to succeed in international competition. But now, here he was, on center stage at 5'3", 115 pounds, the biggest attraction of the Winter Olympics. Figure skating is the main event of the Winter Games. It is rich theater made for TV drama. The anticipation is delicious. For the performers, the pressure is palpable. One tiny mistake, one fraction of a point deducted by unforgiving judges can mean the difference between triumph and tears. Scott Hamilton stood alone in the spotlight. In 1980, the American skater had finished fifth at the games in Lake Placid. Now. After four years of working on eliminating his weaknesses in training, after four years of waiting and dreaming, this was his chance, perhaps his last chance, to win an Olympic gold medal. Hamilton took a deep breath and launched body and soul into his routine. He glided, jumped and spun, arms outstretched. He became one with the music, his flashing skate blades cutting stencils in the ice. Four minutes later, and it was over. Bravos filled the arena, and bouquets tossed from the stands littered the ice. The applause sounded like hard rain. Hamilton reminded us that winners come in all sizes. Wearing a shiny gold medal that hung almost to his waist, the American Olympic champion lived his dream. That night, in Cerevejo, he credited, credited his success to his mental preparedness. Under pressure, Hamilton said, people can perform 15% better or 15% worse. I was among the millions of TV viewers who witnessed Hamilton's performance that night. The skater's comment intrigued me. All of us are performers in the game of life. We face pressure and competition every day, at work, in the boardroom, in the classroom, on the golf course, on the tennis course, the basketball court, and at play. With Hamilton's quote in mind, I began a new career studying psychology of stress and the psychology of success. My mission was to learn all I could about playing under pressure. I wanted to find out why, under pressure, some athletes break through, as Hamilton did, while others break down. In what was, and to what extent, does the mind influence how we perform? What is pressure? Golfer Lee Trevino said, pressure is when you've got 35 bucks riding on a four foot putt and you've only got $5 in your pocket. <laughs> Former Pittsburgh Steelers coach Chuck Noll defined pressure as something you feel only when you don't know what you're doing. During the late stages of a pennant race, former Montreal pitcher Bill Lee was asked how much pressure he was feeling. Never wanted to duck a question, Baseball space cadet thought a moment, then announced. 32 pounds per square inch at sea level. Charles Barkley, the former NBA star, ghibli dismisses the subject, saying, pressure is what you put in tires. But pressure is real. Pressure exists. Every athlete, whether he or she admits it, feels pressure in competition. So, where does pressure come from? Former Denver Broncos quarterback John Elway, a future NFL Hall of Famer, said he always felt the pressure to win, but most of that pressure came from within. Hockey great Mark Mazier agrees, the only pressure I'm under is the pressure I've put on myself. The human body reacts to pressure and stress. The heart beats faster and breathing quickens. No one is immune. Jack Nicholas who has won more major championships than any golfer in history says, pressure creates tension, and when you're tense, you want to get your task over and done with as fast as possible. The more you hurry in golf, the worse you'll probably, probably play. 
which leads to even heavier pressure and greater tension. Listen to tennis star Arthur Ashe. We have a natural tendency to invest more energy when we are under pressure, but when tensions rise, two things happen. The feet can't move and the diaphragm collapses. It's automatic. It's in, it's in the genetic code. Pressure gets a bad name, but it can bring out, bring out the best in you. In fact, if you don't feel any pressure, you're probably not going to do your best. Former big league pitcher Goose Gossage thrived on pressure. I'm not at my best, Gossage once said, until the situation is at its worst. I got to know Gossage when I worked with the Cubs and later the Seattle Mariners. Goose was a master at keeping his job in perspective. I remember asking him how he handled the pressure of being a closer. Gossage said, every time I come into a game, I think of my home, I think of my home in the Rockies, and that relaxes me. And I tell myself, the worst thing that could happen is that I'd be home fishing there tomorrow. Hamilton dealt with pressure in another way. 16 years after watching him win the gold medal, I spoke with Scott when he was in Phoenix with the Star on Ice Tour. When I told him that his 15% quote about pressure became my inspiration for writing this book, the skater smiled. Helmson said he approached his gold medal performance in, in Cerevejo with refined indifference. He had trained for years to prepare for that moment. When the spotlight came on and the music began, he let fate carry him through. The hard work was over. Now, he told himself, go out and enjoy. Sarah Hughes chose the same approach at the 2002 Winter Games in Salt Lake City. In fourth place, after the short program and feeling she had nothing to lose, the 16-year-old took a leap of faith and skated with, and skated with ab abandon. Oops. Sports Illustrated described her performance as unhabilitated joy, while older, more experienced Olympians faltered under pressure. Sarah made history by landing two triple-triple combinations and won the gold. I didn't hold back, he said, beaming. It was my greatest skate ever. Pressure can be a positive force or a negative one. A close friend, Ken Revisa, is one of the first sports psychologists to publish a study on the experience of athletes during their greatest moment in sports. He found that more than 80% of the athletes said they felt no fear of failure. They weren't thinking about their performance. They were immersed in the activity. They were in the zone. The probability of achieving the outcome you want increases when you let go of the need to have it. Go into your mental studio which we discussed in the last section. Recall a time when you broke through, when the pressure worked for you. Notice that you were doing, notice what you were doing, what you were feeling, and what you were saying to yourself. Were you relaxed or tense, excited or anxious? Did you fear failure or feel a desire to win? Were you focused on the outcome or absorbed in the process? Chapter 5. Mental Toughness The most important attribute a player must have is mental toughness. Mia Hamm Competitive toughness is an acquired skill and not an inherited gift. Chris Everett When Joe Bugle coached the Arizona Cardinals, the highest praise he could bestow on a player was a call to him in LTG short for legitimate tough guy. An LTG is a fierce competitor, a battler, an athlete who looks at pressure as challenge, who refuses to lose and never ever quits. An example of an LTG in another sport is the soccer player who once had the ball stolen during a scrimmage. As the defender turned upfield, the player who lost the ball began yanking on the thief's jersey and didn't let go until he fell to the ground his shirt half off. He lay there, grinning in disbelief and admiration at the girl who had, felt, who had fouled him and then walked away without a glance back. Her name is Mariel Margaret Ham, the highest scoring woman in history of international soccer 
is a definition of mental toughness. Shy by nature and labeled as a reluctant star, Mia told her teammates. Nothing stands between us and success but our will to win. It was Mia who said, our warrior mentality means that once we step on the field, we are coming after you with a take no prisoners attitude. The U.S. soccer women's team was the sports story of the year in 1999. The Americans won the World Cup, outlasting China in a final game that featured two exhausting overtimes and a dramatic shout out. If Mia Hamm wasn't their heart, if Mia Hamm wasn't the heart of their team, then she was left ventricle. I'm gonna redo that. If Mia Hamm wasn't the heart of her team, then she was the left ventricle. In this section, we will define the seven characteristics of mental toughness. They are a set of behaviors and beliefs about yourself, your work, your sport, and how you interact. A person who is mentally tough looks at competition as a challenge to rise up to rather than a threat to back down from. Like physical skills, mental toughness can be learned through quality instruction and practice. Competitive. Professional golfer Nancy Lopez clearly defines a competitor. A competitor will find a way to win, she said. Competitors take bad breaks and use them to drive themselves just that much harder. Quitters take bad breaks and use them as reasons to give up. Michael Jordan's flirtation with a Major League Baseball career is testimony to his competitive fire. Why would the greatest basketball player in history attempt to play another sport? Because he couldn't accept not trying. Late in his life, Joe DiMaggio said he would give all his trophies and records to be 25 years old and able to throw and able to compete again. The one thing I both loved and now miss the most, DiMaggio said, was the competition. Confident. Tiger Woods said, every time I play, in my mind, I'm the favorite. Confident athletes have a can-do attitude, a belief they can handle whatever comes their way. They almost never fall victim to self-defeating thoughts. Jordan said he went to every game believing he was the best player on the court until someone proved otherwise and very few did. Control. Successful athletes are able to control their emotions and behavior. They focus on what they can control and don't allow things that are out of their control to affect them. The hallmark of mentally tough athletes is the ability to maintain poise, concentration, and emotional control under the greatest pressure and the most challenging situations. Committed. Mentally tough athletes focus their energy on their goals and dreams. They are self-directed and highly motivated. Listen to John McEnroe. There are scores of players who can hit every shot in the book who never make it into the Grand Slam event. Those who make it there because they are mentally tough, they wanted it more. After his free fall from the top of the tennis rankings, Andre Agassi, redirected himself to the game. He worked hard to get back into shape. The results speak for themselves. Composure. Mentally tough. Athletes know how to stay focused and deal with adversity. In working with hockey teams, I'll sometimes approach a player in the locker room and give him a shove when he isn't looking. I want to see his reaction. Oftentimes, the player will instinctively make a fist and draw back his hand, his arm. Ready to throw a punch. In hockey and basketball, the athlete who, who retaliates is usually the one who gets penalized. I tell tennis players they can expect two or three bad calls in every match, sometimes more. How they manage their emotions can determine whether they win or lose. A mentally tough player will say to himself, okay, I've got to beat the other guy and the referee, then fine, I'll do that. The motto I give to firefighters in the Phoenix Fire Department also applies to you. Keep your cool when the heat is on. Courage. A mentally tough athlete must be willing to take a risk. That's what peak performers do. In the book Adversity, quote, author, Paul, oops, author Paul 
uh, stolts compress uh, compare success with a mountain only climbers get to the top the campers those who get part of the way and decide to stay there stay where they are will never feel as alive or as proud as the climbers as the philosopher said it takes courage to grow up and to achieve your full potential consistency mentally tough athletes possess an inner strength they often play their best when they're feeling their worst they do not make excuses all right so that was chapters four and five um, I'm gonna take a quick break um, and we're back chapter six know your numbers in a close game I check my pulse I know if it gets over 100, it's going to affect my thinking. Phil Jackson. Mentally, I try to stay at a medium level, not too high or not too low. Todd Zeal. In graduate school, the most important psychological concept I learned is something called the performance curve. Draw an upside down U to the left, draw a vertical line and connect it to a horizontal line down beneath the inverted U. Number both lines incrementally from 0 to 10. The horizontal line represents stress and arousal. The vertical line represents performance and pro productivity. As athletes become stimulated, their numbers on both lines increase. When they achieve peak efficiency, when they are performing at their best, physically and mentally, they are at the top of the human function curve, at the apex of the inverted U. Everyone has an optimal number that corresponds with peak performance. I tell all athletes I work with that they need to know their numbers. They also need to recognize their early warning signs. Imagine you are in a car how many RPMs should you be producing so that your motor is running smoothly and efficiently? Not chugging along too slowly, but also not going over the red line. An athlete's ideal number, the optimal level of performance, depended on one, his or her temperament, two, the time or length of the event, and three, the nature of the task. A sprinter, wouldn't have the same number as a marathon runner because the time of the event is different. A basketball center whose job is muscling opponents under the basket would have a different number than, say, a three-point shooter. This is also true of the starting pitchers and relievers. The nature of their task is different. Athletes have different emotional makeups. Some are more high-strung than others. To use the car analogy, one athlete might be a Porsche, another a pickup truck. Just as it's important to know what to do when your vehicle's oil or brake light comes on, it is important to recognize your own early warning signals. When I was with the Cubs, I taught a class on the mental aspects of performing along with major, oops, with former major league pitcher Jim Colburn. To illustrate what I meant by the early warning signs, I would look around the room in the church basement where we met and select one of the pitchers to come to the front of the class and read a chapter of the manual aloud. With some, all you had to do was look at them, hoping they wouldn't be summoned. They shrank before my eyes. One of the greatest fears many people have is the fear of public speaking. Myself. Under stress, some people are cardiac, re cardiac responders. Their heart rate goes up. Some are skin responders. They begin to perspire. Others begin to breathe rapidly, feel their stomachs churn, or feel their neck, 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 uh, <laughs> or feel their neck and back muscles tensing. These are all physical early warning signs. Mentally, our minds start racing. A little voice begins whispering negative thoughts. Not long ago, I received a phone call from an executive of a National Hockey League team. He told me about one of the Cubs, oops, one of the club's top prospects, a promising high-round draft choice who had struggled with uh, who had struggled during his rookie year. 
This guy should be making millions, the executive said, and he's only making thousands. By that, he meant the player, for whatever reason, was underperforming. He had not begun to tap his potential. I agreed to meet with the rookie before the club sent him down to the minor leagues. In our first session, the player confessed he felt a lot of pressure being a high round draft pick. Whenever the game started, he became overly excited. During his first shift on the ice, he overskated the puck. His passes were too long. He lost his composure around the net. After we talked about the performance curve, I asked him, what number are you? I'm a nine or a 10, he said. Sometimes I feel like I'm an 11. Which number when you're playing at your best, I asked. I'm a six or a seven. When the puck dropped, the young player's the young player's tachometer, Jesus, there's that word. It's an inside joke. I apologize. Uh, when the puck dropped, the young player's tachometer was already hitting the red line. Unhappy with the rookie's performance, the coach benched him. Later, when the rookie returned to the game after sitting out several shifts, he said he felt half a, he said he felt a half step slow. His legs were heavy. He missed passes. It was as if he couldn't get up to couldn't get up to speed. What's your number then? I asked. Three or four, he replied. Maybe five. To help him calm down before his games, we changed his routine. In the locker room, the young player began listening to the slower music. During games, I instructed him to pretend he was going in with each shift change. By mentally skating every shift, he was better able to focus on the action and the opponent. Once he returned to the ice, he performed at six or seven, his peak performance number. I told him that performance is like a guitar. He plays for relaxation. If the strings are too loose, the music is flat. If they're too high, if they're too tight, they could snap. Just as, just as the Instrument strings need to be at the right tension. An athlete must have his body turn, tuned for the right performance. Whenever I think of over revving, I am reminded of Dexter Manley. In 1991, after his drug suspension, the former All-Pro with the Washington Redskins joined the Arizona Cardinals. On the day of the Cowboy Games in Irving, Texas, a team doctor came to me. Mac. You've got to go in there. I could hear the concern in his voice. He motioned anxiously toward the training room. It's Dexter. Although we had known each other for only a few weeks, Dexter and I enjoyed a good relationship. I liked him and believed he trusted me. When I entered the inner sanctum of the training room, Manly was the picture of the pent up emotion as high strung as a, th as a thoroughbred lathering in the padlock before the start of a race. His vacant eyes said he wasn't at home. Dexter was in another world. Dexter, Dexter. Slowly I got his attention. As Manly began to settle down, I looked him in the eye and asked what was going on. What was he thinking about? As kickoff neared, Manly said he pictured himself back in the third ward in Houston, the poor neighborhood where he grew up. Mac, I, I don't ever, ever want to be there again. In an attempt to psych himself up for the game, Manly had become over-aroused, which can be counterproductive in an athlete. Even though Dexter was a great pass rusher, the Cardinals didn't want him to put didn't want to put him into the game uh, into the game on third down in short yardage situations for fear he would jump offside and give the other team a free first down. The two cases illustrate the importance of a performance curve and knowing your numbers. A quote to remember came from former big league pitcher Carl Hubble, who invented the screwball. Hubble said, I had no choice of controlling a ball game until I first controlled myself.